Hi, everyone, again. Um, so today, I will be talking about responsible AI and explainable AI. Um, it's more like a one-on-one -on -one in terms of responsible AI and explainable AI, and how they are both connected. So I will start talking about responsible AI, of course, what are the principles, what are the main developer phases, how it connects with ex explainable AI. And at the end, I will showcase an, an, a paper that it's making a new approach in terms of explainable AI. It's more like re related with human explainable AI. So it just to be, just that will, will be mainly the talk. So first, I know it's 11 a.m., so we should be okay to see a big sun out. We are not so hungry. So the idea is to use the analogy of making a pizza to explain responsible AI. So we have principles when we would like to use responsible AI or when we, we, we need to meet something using responsible AI. We have principles. Of course, in the, in the papers and all the documentation that you can find, there are multiple principles. I prefer to highlight the main four principles that you can see in most places because the, the documentation is, is pretty new and the concepts, you can find multiple concepts and multiple different concepts everywhere. So the first one is fairness. Um, the PIXA, if we're talking about the PIXA, it talks about having the toppings equally distributed in each slice. Um, in this case, it's, I think it's arugula and cheese, yes. Um, hopefully it's not pineapple. I don't know if you are big fans of pineapple. Um, not a big fan, but in that case, it will be equally distributed. So the same amount of toppings to each particular pe person, each particular slice. In AI, it is if you would like to do, this is mainly related with bias. So you can have a data set that is biased and you would like to avoid it. You should be avoiding training your model with a biased data set, of course. You have tools that we will see later. Second one is transparency, which is in the PIX analogy is if you would like to go to a place, you should know how they cook the pizza, how they prepare the pizza, what is the recipe, if it's a Napolitan pizza, or if it's an American pizza, or if it's, I don't know, there are different kinds of pizzas. So you should know, or they should publish you, or they should show you how they are preparing this pizza. So you will trust in this pizzeria because they are sharing the recipe. In terms of AI, it's sharing the models that they are using or, or how they are working with the data or how they are dealing with the data that it could be from the pre-processing, from the modeling, from the training, the, the modeling, and, how, and of course, how to use the data in the model. The third one, third one, it's accountability. In the pizza, if you get, receive a pizza that it's overcooked, you need to know that someone is in, is in charge of this pizza. They, they would like to replace you. The pizza, they would like to, new, to give you a new pizza. Um, or probably if you don't like the pizza, you can ask for a new one. So someone has to be responsible for building, that, for making this pizza and to give you a different pizza with different toppings. You probably ask for pepperonis, and if you get pineapple, you won't like the pineapple, so you would like to ask the pepperonis. And in AI, it's of course, someone has to be responsible of this application of this model. Now, we are all seeing the LLMs hype, and the question here is who is responsible for this model? It's the person that is training the model, it's the person that is implementing the model, the person that is doing the fine tuning, or the company that is doing the fine tuning. So someone should be, a, should be the owner of this application. The last one is privacy and data protection. In the big analogy, it is to protect the data of the employees. So you don't know the names of the people that is working there because it's protected, or you probably don't know the exactly uh, cheese provider or the exactly person that is providing the cheese. So this is internally pr protected. In the AI, <coughs> it's, it's more about protecting how you work with the data. For instance, if you are training a model to detect, to make a fraud detection system, you don't want to share the data of your customers. So I like to keep the data hidden and to protect the data. This could be related to something with GDPR, but this in, more in, that, in that line. 
So what you will get at the end is if you, if you go to a pizzeria and the pizzeria is following these four principles, you would choose this principle. You will go to buy a pizza in that place. Same happens, or same can happen with AI. If you will trust to a model or to an application, you will give your data to this application if they are following the four main principles. Four main principles and or more principles, right? Um, but now, that's okay with the pixel, so we are, ready with the, we are done with the pixel. And we have, but we are mainly developers. So if you would like to build a model, it's okay with the principles, but you need tools to build this model to meet these each particular four um, principles. So without going into details, you need, the first one is you need to check if your data set is biased. The way that you check it, it's if you know the data, you can see or you can do some query and you can see if it's biased by gender, age, or whatever. And you have some tools, whether it's the IBM i360 or the Google What If. They are open source tools that you can go there and you, and you will give. And these tools will give you if the data set is biased or non biased. And they can also de bias the data set if it's oriented to one particular gender or whatever. The second one is you have to detect or you should detect proxy, proxy variables, which is sometimes is not implicit, the bias, for instance. It's easy if you like to detect gender or age or country or whatever, but sometimes you can get this information through other information or through different information. That can be, for instance, if you see the monetary status, you can get the sex or someone can get the sexual orientation of this person. Or if you have a geographic patterns, you can see the ethnicity of this person. So you, you would like to avoid that to make your data set less biased. The, the last three, or the main ones, is you should have some, you should have the data set documented, how you treat the data, where the data come from, in LLMs, for instance, or it could be LLMs or computer vision, or any use case, is which was your data set to train the model. Like in LLMs, you train the data set for a particular use case. So you train for finance. So you get the data from particular banks and you train your model, or healthcare or whatever. But where the data came from, you should have it documented because I didn't talk yet, but probably you can use it to make your model better, to, to, to work better, or it could be some regulations that you need to meet that you will need to explain when you are making a decision or the model is taking a decision. You should explain why the model did that. The last two is explainable AI that we will go deep later. That is, you can have the principles and you can have everything, but you need to you need tools or you need something to help you to explain why the model is taking that decision. There are family, it's very advanced, and there are multiple algorithms and multiple ways to do it. But explainable AI is basically, it's basically that what you need. You need something to give you insights about the decisions. And the last one, which is pretty important, that is, while you are implementing your model, and it can help on the data protection part and in the, in, in the privacy part, let's suppose that your application is centralized or working in multiple devices, you need to protect the data or you need to protect the model when the model is working. So in that case, you can use te techniques like PPML, which is privacy protection machine learning, so it's, encrypt it's encrypting the machine learning process. Of course, I will not go in detail, but just to let you know that we have that. And OpenFL, which is a federated learning framework. So when you're doing, when you're training a model in a federated way, you should, pr you should protect the data of each particular node. So there's a, another technique that could be useful, but you, you also should be aware of, okay, it's not just following the principles, I need to protect the data when I'm working with the data or when you are training this model. So just to show an example of the first one to detect bias, this is just an example of something that I wanted to highlight. This is the case of the IBM. So you have a data set. In this case, it's the German credit scoring. 
and you would like to see if it's biased or if it's not biased. So what it happened here, here it's saying that you have multiple features that equal opportunity, index, and so on. And you can see, you can visually see if the data set that, that you are working, it's biased or not. This is just a visualization tool, but you can go one step ahead and you can say, okay, could you please de-bias this data set for me? And this tool has the chance to do it. But it's then a step behind to be before training, training the, 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 the model. It's something that you do before that also. So it's not just one tool. It's not just one thing that you say, okay, I have one, one tool. I put everything here, and I'm protected about uh, uh, responsible AI, expanded by AI, and I can get everything in just one place. It's not the case. You have to use multiple tools, and depending on your use case and your need, you will probably use different toolkits. So once you have a model, I suppose that you have a model trained to detect if an email is a fraud or it's not a fraud, and you can have some questions. Let's suppose that you have a model, and it's saying that, yes, this email, it's fraud. But you can make some questions. I mean, it's OK. You probably need to know. You probably need to understand why did the model took that decision, based on what, based on what features, variables, uh, why not something else? Because you don't know. And the, should, the, the second one is, how do, you, do I correct an error that probably if you're not an AI user, or if you're not developing the model, you would like to say, OK, you said that it's a spam, but it's not fraud. So how can I cor correct that, or how can I modify that to make it more uh, trustable? And the, second, and the last one is, should I trust it? Which is more like a human perception, because at the end of the day, what, we are humans using these models. So we need to create models that are trustworthy for people, basically. So, why do we need explainable AI to try to answer those questions? This is a, a quote that I think that it's pretty useful. Uh, if you go to the, to the papers and so on, the terms could be used interchangeably. You can say explainability, you can say, you can say interpretability, you can say multiple things. But basically, what is expl explainability? It was provide insights to a targeted audience to fulfill a need. So it's a targeted audience. You are doing something to a particular audience, which means is that if you have a solution that works for healthcare, the explanations that you will give to some particular verticals will be different. I mean, could be different or could not be different, but for sure they should be different because the audience is different, the use case is different, the explanations that they need that they are different, and Probably for some people it's different. Probably some people need some kind of explanations, and some other people need other kinds of explanations. So as I said, it's it's more related with perspectives. It's to who we are explaining that. So we have five angles. That could be more, but here I wanted to highlight five more, five angles. The first one is the regulatory perspective. So you need to write the explanation, like. GDPR, you are probably, you should be forced to explain why the model did something. If you are using Uber or if you are using a fraud detection system in Europe in that GDPR is, is used, you need to do it. So it's not, it, it's not that you are, yeah, you are forced to have an explanation on that, on that topic. So you need to find something that can give this kind of explanations to regulations, which is, could be understandable, could not be understandable, but it's what they need. And the other explanations could be related with scientific or for the person that is developing the model. If you are working with LLMs, you probably will need to understand why the attention layer or why the detail of the model did something. And this insight will help you to improve your model, to make it, more under, to, um, to make it better, and to improve your model. So if I go to these explanations to an end user, probably the, the end user will not understand what is an attention layer, of course. But for a, an AI de de developer or for the scientific perspective, it's pretty important. And last one, there are the end users. So as I said, the 
people that is consuming your application, people that has no idea about AI, that they need to understand or visually understand, okay, why did you do that? So, as you can see, there are multiple ways to explain a model, and you need to find the right one for each particular use case. This it has a lot of details. Of course, I will not go in details. But the, the main idea to explain here is that you have an explanation. You will like an explanation. OK, it's not working. You like an explanation, right? And, that's, that, and this explanation, it's mainly divided in three parts. The first is data explainability. The thing goes, explain the data, as we said, with the bias and so on, which is previously of your, it's before you are training your model. So you need explanations about your data, related with your data. And you have a family of things uh, that the main idea is to remove the bias, remove the overfeeding, or try to avoid these kind of uh, problems that you can have when you're training a model. Second one is the model explainability. Everything, as I said, related with the model, going in details of the model, trying to understand how the model works, and how to make the model to perform better. And the last one, that is the one that I will go in details later, is the post hoc explainability. Once you have the model trained, once you have a model with no bias, once you have a model perfect, someone will need to know, okay, why did you do that? Did you do that? Or why did the model did that? So this is the post hoc explanations. So it seems confusing at the beginning, but it was pretty easy to, to read. But now, you probably know that the models that are out, out there, decision trees, regressions, transformers, GPT, neural networks. And the challenge that we have is, if you like to get better or what's going on in the last years, is that we are improving in accuracy. We are doing models that are better, that perform better, like GPT, I mean, LLMs or with computer vision, compared with five years ago it was pretty different. So now they are performing much better. But the thing is that the, the interpretability or the explanation that you can get from those models, those models, it's almost impossible to understand what's going on inside. And it's, it behaves like a black box. And it's for scientists. And it's something that is really hard. We can understand how they work internally. But it's pretty hard to really go into details. So these, these transformers or even the neural networks, uh, you, you, you cannot see what's going on inside. And the easiest part is the decision trees. So decision trees is something that you see. So you know which part of the model, which leaf of the model the algorithm is, is, is following to give you an answer. So it's pretty visual. Um, so we have a challenge. We need to explain these models are the most complicated models that most people is starting to use, like deep learning. If we start talking about the 200s, the 2000s, most people started to, to use neural networks. We started to, to use more neural networks compared than decision trees because we like to solve a problem. So we are, we, most of the time, we try to find algorithms that solve our problems. If they are complicated, You'll see later, but they solve our problems. So the challenge that, that we have is what we can do with all these models that we have or that we are using. And this is another complicated slide. Seems to be complicated, but it's not complicated. So as I said, the post hoc, which is you have the model, and you have multiple approaches to try to find an explanation. You have mainly we can separate in two families. One family is I have the model, and for me, it's like a black box. And I would like to understand not how the model works, but how the model took that decision. So I will not go into details of the model. I will not touch the model. I will try to find a way to find an explanation using the inputs and the outputs, just looking that thing. This is what SHAP is. I will explain later. But this is a, this part of, oh, this is not working. It's this one, right? SHAP. And the other common or most common use is Lime. Lime, it's a bit different. They, instead of having, as I showed be before, 
these complicated models, let's suppose that you have a transformer or you have a neural network, the attribution models or LIME or all this family that is up there, they try to create a parallel model that is simpler, that is understandable, that could be a decision tree, uh, to try to explain what the main model is doing. So instead of using a BERT or a transformer or a neural network, you can probably get the same results using a very explainable model. So and since the model is explainable, you can use this model to do the predictions instead of using the, the neural network. It could be more challenging because sometimes you cannot get the same results, uh, but it works well, let's see. But these are two approaches, um, and within these two approaches, you have tons of multiple variations that some of them, they use um, parallel models with sharp and parallel models with uh, an alternative models, ensemble of models. I mean, but these are the main concepts. Or I go in, in detail of the model, or, or I just see input and output. And this is what sharp is. You treat the, mo the, the, the model as a black box, so you just see the input and the output. You have features. Of course, in this case, age, sex, BP, when I don't know what it is, and BMI. And what you will get is the wave of each feature for one particular uh, prediction, you can say. Right? So in this case, I wanted to know something, and it says that age was the most important feature, and sex or gender were the, was the less important feature in that case. But this is just technical, right? What you can do after, once you have this information, this is going to the beginning that, is it important for the end user? Probably not, probably it could be useful, it could not be useful, but this is a kind of explanation that, that, that you can use. Um, if you like to go deep in this sharp prediction that is not using the model, we have a toolkit that is open source which is explain Intel explainable AI tools, which is, we try it. Because one of the challenges that you have with this is that if you like to use Lime, you need to go to the Lime site or download the Lime GitHub. If you like to use Sharp, you have to go to Sharp. If you like to use any others, you have to go to each particular GitHub. What we are trying to do here is we are trying to centralize everything so you can use just in one place, you can use Sharp, you can use Lime, and you can use multiple use cases. Uh, I wanted to do a demo, but uh, I didn't have the time to do it because it could take time. But this is a, an example that is, let's suppose that we would like to know what the heart disease system, and we would like to know which features it was important to make that, that classification. So these are the inputs, and the label is at the end, which is if the heart disease is fixed, normal, reversible, which I don't know what it is, but it's the kind of labeling, right? So, um, so you train a model as you normally do. You use TensorFlow, you compile your model, you fit your model. This is as usual, could be TensorFlow, could be PyTorch, could be Scikit-learn or whatever. This is the model that you get, of course. Um, this is related with TensorFlow, so it's as usual. And what you do after that is once you have your model trained, you ask for the explainer. So you, you use the API that you, and you send the model and you send a particular part or you send the, the line of the code that you would like to get the explanation. And what you get is the answer. As I showed before, we can see what was more important and what has less importance. So three, three tablespoons, we don't know what it is, what the most important part or the most influenced feature in that particular decision, and old peak was the less important part, what, what the less important feature. And same as before, so it's just information that you can use or you cannot use, but it could be important to, even for you, if you are training your model, you can say that these features are important or some other features are not important. But it also works with BERT, but with GPT or these other models. As, it, as it's a black box, and you are not going in this black box, um, 
you can use whatever model. I mean, you can use the latest model, whatever. In that case, I would do the same with BERT. So you train your BERT model, you download your BERT trained model, you invoke for, for the explainer, same thing. You send the data set and you say everything. This case is, to, is a text classifier. So you say it's like a sentiment analysis, if it's positive or negative. So what you will get is you get which parts of the paragraph or the text the model took as positive and the model took as negative. In this case, the red ones are the negatives. You see not bad, not good, and so on. It's negative. And the positives are the blue. So this part of the... And the model usually weights this to see, OK, this phrase of this part was, is a positive or is a negative part. And, but this is also important to, to know if the model is performing well. In text, if, you're like, if you are doing that things, it's not able to detect ironies and so on. So you can see here uh, if it's working well, the model with the ironies, or not, it's not working so well. But this is another way to get explanations. Um, but as I said at the beginning, we have every, everything that we developed is by ourselves, by, 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 by ourselves. It's, we need to create an explanation for us, and we create those explanations based on what we think it could be useful for the audience. It could be finance, healthcare, or whatever. But this is a human interaction, so you need to put the human interaction or the human-computer interaction in the middle of the wave. So you can have the best part of the best model to explain something, but if it's not useful for the end users, or they will not trust to your model, or they will not use your model to, for whatever you are trying to sell. So you need to add the human part here. And how we can do that is by as simple as just interviewing your audience, as simple as that, um, trying to see what they like, what, what they would like to see, if it's useful or not. And this is what this paper did which is a paper that this is from Intel Labs, and it's an interview that they did. And they picked this Merlin application. Uh, it's pretty useful. I mean, I tried to use it here, and it's pretty useful. It's an application to detect birds. So in that case, I have a goose, a Canadian goose, because I'm from Canada. Um, and it detects the goose, right? And the idea is to talk to the end users of this application and give them explanations and see, try to see what they think about those explanations. So the questions are uh, if it's important, how they would like to use explanations, and if it's useful for them. They show these four explanations. What, for me, for instance, the last one is the better, but because I'm more close to AI, but they propose heat map, exam example basis, or concept basis, or prototype basis. Heat map is like, in computer vision, you can have the same explanations. So you will get a heat map of with the most important parts that the model see to take that decision, or to classify, or to identify the, the bird in this case. So they give the heat map examples. They said, OK, I took that decision because this bird is similar to these other birds. Concept base is similar to SHAP. You get values, you get numbers by each feature. And the last one is, this is, why it is what I like the most, because it's highlighting which zones of the bird were important to classify the bird. Here we can see, OK, sometimes probably it's not important for the user, but this is what we can see. And the perception where. They divide it in two people, in two kinds of knowledge people, between high knowledge of AI and lo low knowledge of AI. And you see that the results were different. So for, for high, if you have a high AI, you think that the, that the, head, that, that, that the heat map is intuitive, because it, it is, for us, it, it is. But for a, for a person that has no idea about AI, it's related with, to weather for them. Because the blue, the red, so. <laughs> and, 
And the, the other one is same with the concept basis. Uh, concept based. This is great for us, for me, because you have data, you have the features, you have a value, and you have everything. Uh, but it's not so useful for people that have no idea about it. Say so stuff like this will go right over my head and make no sense because it's numbers and so on. So what we get at the end is we get a gap. We get a huge gap in the middle. And we have one solution, but we have multiple end users or multiple consumers of the solution. And we need to find a way to fill this gap. For instance, the creators and the end users, if they both have, know about AI, of course they are satisfied with explanations, and, but the, the users with low AI, they don't care about ex explanations, or they would like to see practical examples, and because they would like to collaborate with the system, okay, I see that the model is detecting that it is a particular kind of bird, okay, I would like to help the model to improve or to make it better. Uh, and they are, they, said, they don't like it, they didn't like it, to be honest. So, we can say two things from this slide. The first one is, it's perfect for people that have an AI knowledge. So we are doing something, or we are usually building software or models that are good for us, not for the end users, or for the people that have no idea about how to use AI. And mainly we need to fill this gap between the AI knowledge and the low AI knowledge. But we need to see it, and the only way to see it is we need to talk to people, we need to understand what they need, and something that for us is really easy to understand or really useful, for some people it's not. And they will be the consumers of our application, so we need to be aware of that. And, okay, recapping, how does it fit everything? So you have the principles that I talked at the beginning, with the, with the pineapple pizza and so on. We have, we have fairness, privacy. Once we have these principles, but explainable AI is something that it's like feeding those principles. And once you have everything in the middle, once we are working with everything almost, you will get the, the responsible AI, or we will meet the responsible AI goal. Um, as I said, it depends. Sometimes most, some of them are important, some of others are not relevant for the use case that you are working. But you need to know that at least there are some steps that you should follow. We didn't talk about that ethics. Ethics is another huge topic, but uh, we didn't go into detail, but it also goes within this, this explanation. Uh, conclusion, so we have an, it's non-fits-all solution. As I said, you need to find the right solution for you, for your use case, for your audience. Uh, the real use cases that it happened in this, that happened in this use case, in this example, can expose pitfalls in explainable AI existing methods. So probably we don't see it, but we need to, to do that. Um, the, one of the most important is explainable AI has to answer the why, not the what. So we need to know why the model is taking that decision, why the model did that, not what or not how, because the users probably don't care about that. Um, and the explanations, which is the last one, is very important, are part of your value proposition. Even if we need to meet with some requirements of GDPR, which is good because we need to meet it, but if you are building a solution, your value proposition is, okay, my model, I am totally transparent with you, the data set that I'm using, how I trained, it's not biased, and it's part of the value proposition when we are explaining that. Call to action, of course, we encourage the community to try to reduce, to help us to reduce the gap between, the last gap between the high AI knowledge audience and the low AI knowledge audience. Um, as I said, there are multiple models. Some of them works for healthcare, some of them works for finance, some of them works for multiple verticals. But uh, 
what I used to see as there are not m too much collaboration between both of them. So they are working, you have the finance or have the healthcare community, but probably some healthcare problems were solved using finance models. So they can work for both of them. And there is no one centralized place. As I said, that could be a good project to try to centralize, but really to centralize everything in one toolkit. Um, yeah, toolkit or place or project or something like that. Um, and the collaboration here is also, I mean, of course, is key. And that's it. Thank you so much. Any, any questions? Thank you for your time. What I was asking myself is uh, for large language models like ChatGPT, uh, which have a large variety of use cases, how can this topic be applied? I think it's a bit harder and also expectations might be very different uh, from different users. Yeah, usually with large language, good question, thank you. Um, I think that for large language models, we have, when we try to use large language models, we download something that's generic and we don't know what it was trained. Even if it says the model car, if you download for high effects, for instance, they say that, okay, it was trained on one particular data set and so on. Um, but these models, they could be racist or they could, because they were training the entire data set of the world, for instance. And probably the ethics in that part is important. You need to be care, or need to be careful about, you need to add an extra layer because even if the model would like to comment something that could be racist, you need to put this layer to try to avoid that. And it could be racist or it could be biased or whatever, right? Because the models, they are prepared for the answer. Um, I see that this part is very, is, very, is very important to use it. There are some toolkits that you can use for that to try to avoid that. Um, after that, you, if, if you would like to use it in your environment, finance, healthcare, you probably will need to fine tune that. And this, the part of the remove the bias and remove everything, it's also important to have your model just for, you, for your data, for your environment. But I believe that the most important part is to set the guardrails of those models. Because you, you will check with all the models, if you try with all of them, they, are, they can all be biased. And they are biased, and they say, and they have a disclaimer that they say, okay, this model can be racist, so it's up to you if you like to use it or how you use it. So even if the model is great, you need to build this extra layer of security. Did I answer your question? Yes. All right, thank you. All right, all right. Thank you so much for your time and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.